Um, last week, I don't know about you, but last week was so powerful to me. I thought Pastor, and first of all, he always bats it out of the ballpark. He's so funny. I was, uh, doesn't he? Yeah, like there's, whoop! Um, he always says something to me. So, well, I say something to him, and then he repeats back to me. And he's, he's just, he's so humble of a, of a pastor. I'll always say, Aaron, you're such a good teacher. You're such a good teacher. And he always says to me, same line, you think so? And I say, yes, I do. I know so. You really are such a great teacher. But last week, I thought he really batted it out of the ballpark. Last week, we talked about a couple of things. Our purpose, and that is to be loved by God. I held on to that all week long. I don't know about you, but it feels good to be loved. And to know you're loved by God, and I think we might know that, but to be, remember it, to be part of it in our lives, how powerful is that? And then we also talked about our calling, and our calling is to be in relationship with God, to go that next level, right? To talk to our Heavenly Father like we would talk to our best friend. You've got a confidant right there. The great news in all of this equation is this, and I, and I love this one. I didn't have to do a thing. There was no to-do list. You ever go to church and you feel like, you leave with a checklist of, not our church, by the way, just saying. You leave with a checklist of what things you need to do to be a better Christian, to be a better follower of Christ, right? That has nothing to do with what we talked about last week. We had the opportunity to just sit and receive all of God's blessing in our lives, all of the relationship that he has, that he made us to love us. He was so purposeful. And to receive that is such good news this morning that we want to play off of that one step further. We're going to go a little deeper than even we did last week with something about this. And this, this week, we're going to be talking about that we were called to belong. We were called to belong. You know, this, this word belong, and, and Pastor Aaron had this kind of last minute, like, get out of town idea, right? I don't know, it was Tuesday or Wednesday. He was like, hey, would you like to? I'm like, oh, no, no, okay, here I go. Let's, let's, let's bring it on. So I went to work, right? I went to work because I want to honor God in every way, shape, and form. So I went to work, and I was like, let's dive into this word belong. And all week long, as I hang into my head, like, belong, 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 and I'm feeling good about it. And I thought, what would success mean or be today for all of us who had an opportunity to hear what's you know, on this paper. And that is that we walked out knowing that we belong to God. And we could say that to people. We could say it boldly, and we can say that with confidence. Because belonging is indeed a powerful word. It's a purposeful word. The meaning is the property of, the acceptance into, the association with, the closeness, and the fellowship of. Of course, I'm going to hang on that word fellowship. Because that, to me, is the most important. But it's different than when you belong to something, it's not dependent upon how you do. Today is a good day, a bad day. Do I belong or do I not belong? I don't know, right? When you belong to God, you know you're in. The Bible says it this way. God is the one who made us, who made all things, and all things are for his glory. He wanted to have many children to share his glory. He wanted to have many children. Well, he's God. God gets to do, last I remember, he gets to do whatever he wants to do. And he made the decision that he decided he was lonely and wanted to have a family. So he made a family. You make a family by starting with us. We are not an accident. He called us to be his family. He made us so that we could be part of his family. And that, again, is good news. That family is called a church. It's called a church. So the second purpose of my life is that God formed me for his family. I want to capture that. I want you to write that down. I want you to know that in such a way that you believe it. God formed me for his family. Not somebody else's family, by the way. Not somebody else's family. So if you circle the word me on that, right, he, he formed me for his family. What he's referring to is you and you and you and you and of course, me. He formed me for his family. That's a calling on my life. And that feels good. That calling gives you substance. It gives you importance. It gives you stability and structure to know how to operate within. Paul says it this way. His unchanging plans have always been to adapt us into his own family from the beginning by bringing us to himself through that of which is Jesus Christ. Adopt. So I have, right, I have this word belong hanging here. My prayer is that all of you, that's the word for you for the days and the weeks to come. 
But I also love this word adopt. It's so different. Right? When you're adopted into, it says you're adopted, it's like meaning you bring up as your own. You bring up as your own. There's no question. Well, if you, you know, I don't know. How, let's see how you do. I might give you back. It don't work that way. No, he's adopted us as his own. He loves us. He knew he would love us, and he wants us. He calls us to be part of his family. God's family is called the church. I want you to write that down because I want you to get that. There's a correlation. So there's me, there's our family, and now there's our church. We have God in our church, and we are family, and we are adopted together. He's called us to his church because it's the one thing we can count on, eternity, right? It will last forever and forever and forever, and there is stability, and there is structure, and there is confidence in the fact that if I know who I am in the family of God and I have a church that I can call home, I can walk in all of the power and all of the might that he calls us to do. And that is good news. Paul says it this way, I'm writing to you so you will know how to live in the family of God. That family is the church of the living God, the support and the foundation of the truth. Paul makes it perfectly clear. If you're highlighting or you're underlining foundation, right, support and foundation by the living family. Without it, it's opinion. Without it, we take it on ourselves. But within the family of God, we know we can find the support and the foundation because we're in relationship to each other. We're called here. It's not an accident. We're here today on purpose, and now let God reign because of that. So now let's talk about our calling. Fill this in for me. I am called to belong to his church. We've talked about it, but I want you to believe it. We're called to belong, right? Importance of, knowing that I'm part of. Here's the thing. Called to belong to what? His church. He didn't say his gym. He didn't say his country club, right? He didn't even say the rewards program at Vaughn's that gives me 10 cents off of my gas. <laughs> he said he's called me to his church for the rewards that are in heaven that are bigger and better than I could ever imagine in my life. But yet we find our significance in all of those other belongings, right? I'm part of this gym, right? Oh, yep, I saved 10 cents today, right? I find that. I find that. I find purpose in that in my life. And God, we, we serve such a loving God. He's just going along for the ride with us. He, he knows us. But what he's really called us to is his church, to be part of his family. Bible says it this way. So now you are no longer visitors or strangers. That's good news. You are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. He makes his point over and over and over again. And yet sometimes I think we just throw it away. Family. Yeah, we're part of family. Mm -hmm. God's family. Great, great church family. No, we are family because we have a common God that we serve. Let's not forget it. Romans says it this way. You are among those who have been called to belong to Christ. Called to belong to Jesus Christ. Church isn't an event. It's not a program. Some of us would say it is a building. I thought about it this morning, right? Knowing what I was going to say and how everybody's driving here. I'm going to go to church. We might think we're going to a building. We're going to church. And that is not the case. It is not something we go to. Here's the word of the day. It's something we belong to. It's something we belong to. So just maybe from this day forward, when you put the, in, you know, the keys in the car and you're starting it and you're going to church, you're thinking about it differently. I get to go to church to belong to a body of believers that I want to be with and support each other by and be encouraged by. I get to belong to. Church is a relationship. We get to worship here, that great worship. And we worship big here, don't we? We love our worship. Thank you, God. Right? Because that's what God calls us to in his church. We are first to come and worship him. It is the opportunity we can. Right? I can sing in the shower all I want. But when the body comes together, it's powerful and it's mighty and it's strong. We give God our best here, and it's a place to be in fellowship with. Again, church is our relationship. I want to share with you over the next few minutes five benefits of belonging. 
And they're powerful. There's nuances here that I want you to catch in my prayer this morning as I was doing that for all of us today in all of these services, that there's nuances that if we miss the nuance, we miss God. So my prayer right now is, is Lord, that we just lift that up to you and we, 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 we each of us receive what you have for us individually right now through a story, through a, through a verse, through something that just clicks with you that you won't forget. In fact, the only thing that can meet your deepest needs are these five things that we're going to talk about. In the Bible, the church is referred to this. All good, all interesting, I think. It's referred to as a family. We've been talking about that. We're going to talk a little bit more about it in just a second. It's referred to a temple. It's referred to a body. It's referred to a flock. And it's referred to as a garden. So let's write this down. So we have five metaphors, and this is the first one. In God's family... I learned my true identity. I want you to circle true. Very purposeful. I discover my true identity. You probably know what I'm going to go and where I'm going to take this, right? We find our identity in a lot of different things in a lot of different places. The, here's the answer to the question. The only true identity that matters is that in which God says about us, period. But we search so hard in our life to find identity in all the things that you could buy, you could own, you could acquire, that you drive, that you live in. We find our identity in all of that. And where I think God is so funny, and, I, and by the way, I mean that respectfully, because I want to serve a fun God. I want to serve a God with a God with a sense of humor. I want to love him like I can, right, my best friend. Like, I just, I just want to be in relationship. I want to laugh together. And I laugh the fact that today, right, I have the opportunity to do this message, a guy who spent his entire career finding cool things, building cool companies, because I was trying to help people find their identity in the things that are of this world. Now, that's really funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's really funny. I no longer do that, and look what I'm doing, right? I find that humorous, but God is purposeful. He is purposeful. Without the contrast in that, I would have no clarity in my life. I do now. You think about the logos, right? You think about the things that, um, that, that, that we, we think about that we need to own or that we need to buy, and you might be saying right now, well, Steve, you think that way because that's what you did in your career, right? So you found all these cool things and cool companies, but not me. That's not me. I'm going to challenge you because I do not want to be on this island by myself, all right? I think that there is some sense of identity that's found when we stop at Starbucks to pick up that cup of coffee, and I have the Starbucks coffee cup. Why do we all stop at Starbucks? There's somehow that I'm in the club. I'm in the I'm in the cool cup club, right? <laughs> because the last I looked, when I looked inside that coffee cup, that coffee that I got at 7-Eleven for $1.25, whatever it was, was as good as that cup of coffee at Starbucks. That logo had some meaning to me. The last thing I really know about myself is I'm kind of a tech junkie. I want the latest and greatest. Do I really need the latest and greatest? Don't leave me hanging here. Maybe you're the same way, right? <laughs> you need the latest and greatest because somehow my life is better because of that. But in my drawer, in my desk drawer, guess what I have? I have old iPhones and I have a flip phone that I'm sure still works. And the only reason I bought it, I upgraded, I traded it in was because somehow it was going to reflect me. Okay, and let's, ladies and men, I just want to talk about designer <laughs> activewear apparel for just a second. <laughs> Okay, expensive, one thing, we sweat in it, all right? Is it really that important? A pair of sweat shorts on a treadmill will get you the same result without breaking your bank. Come on, right? Come on. So the next time you make a purchase, re just reflect on it. What is the value to me? What am I trying to get out of this? What do I want to accomplish by owning, having, purchasing, wearing, whatever, okay? Just think about that for a second. The truth of this, this little example is that our identity comes from our relationships, not from the things we buy, not of the things we wear, not of the things we possess. Our true identity, however, comes found in the relationships to God's family. 
When I'm surrounded by believers and we're in the conversation, right, I find who I am and their opinion matters to me because they see me like God sees me. And I don't know about you, but that's the only person I care about. I care about what God sees me. You know, in our relationships, there is truth to this, though, that good relationships, good relationships usually mean a good identity. There's a connection there. When you have bad relationships, the odds are you probably have difficult relationships. And that's not, that's sad. The reality is that we are in choice of where those relationships come from, right? Well, here's what I know about myself. I know that I'm a son. I know I'm a father. I know I'm a husband. I know that I'm an employee. I'm also maybe a boss and an employer, but I'm also a pastor. And all of that, we all have something. There's not one versus another, better or worse, but we all evaluate who we are against how we describe ourselves. So that contrast has to be seen in the way that God sees that because that's the only place we're going to find true identity. Only place we're going to find. Ask people who struggle. Ask divorced people. Ask people who have been married for a lot of years or actually even for a few months, Right? They struggle knowing their identity, and the closer and the more help that we can have and do as a body of believers to help them see the way that God sees them, the sooner that they're going to have the joy and the fulfillment that God wants in their life. That's what we're called to do. So the problem is that most of us don't have very good relationships growing up, and some of us might even say this, that my family's dysfunctional. I'm not taking a poll. Okay? <laughs> My family's broken. They're non-existent in my life. And yet it's such a contrast to what we know we want, don't we? We want families that are loving. They're unconditional. They're supportive. They're accessible. And we don't have those in many, many, many cases. So this morning, as, as I was, as, um, not this morning, but as I'm pondering where we're going next in this conversation and this dialogue, I want to share with you my story. I want to share with you my testimony, and I want to share, you, share with you a couple things that are really important that I share. Number one <clears throat> is there's no story that's better than another story. We all have a story. We all have a place where we met God, and God met us, and that is so powerful. And I think it's funny. The word testimony basically says my testimony. And by the way, it's not my testimony. It's God's testimony. It's God's testimony of his love and his and his, and his unconditional love and his, just his mercy over my life that's so beautiful. So I want us to have those ground rules going into this, but I want to share with you my story. You know, today I hope I don't embarrass myself. <laughs> I was praying for that this morning, by the way. You know, I can do that. I can shed a tear pretty easy. But there's victory I want you to tell you the outcome is victory, victorious. There is victory in that of Jesus. So we know the end of the story already, but the story is important because it's always a process. It's always a process from here to there. So for a little support today, I wanted to throw up my um, photograph of my family here. So great. I love them so much. <clears throat> here you go. Woo! It didn't take long, did it? <laughs> but what I can tell you about them is that through the trials and tribulations of life, they've been there for me. They have been there for me, rooting me on, helping me get connected to God. Amen. So here you go. So here's, so here's, a, here's a ugly little question for you. You ready for this one? What do you do when you're an only child, beaten by your mother, and this is well known by everybody you could possibly know. This is known by your family. It's known by your friends. It's known by the next door neighbor. It's known by your friends. Only child, beaten. Conceived out of wedlock, I was told I was a mistake. And from the very beginning of my life, that's what I remember. And it's not something I just wrote for an impact. I remember it as clear as ringing. Now, listen, I'm not harboring that. The pain of that doesn't exist any longer. I've been freed of that, but I remember that. And let me tell you how you survive. You survive because you learn to conform. Whatever you're dealt with, you learn to conform by your situation. 
I didn't know any better. I just know what I was told. I was know what was spoken over me. And oh, by the way, catch yourself. Parents, husbands, wives, catch yourself. Because if you don't catch yourself, you're going to speak things over people that you're going to have to be, repent for later. And that pain is going to cause other people pain. And we don't want to do that. I know we don't want to, especially as the body of believers. I was told I was ruined my parents' wedding by my mother being pregnant. Now, that's funny. I didn't do that. <laughs> I mean, seriously, come on. Get over yourself, Mom. Don't blame me for your own issue. You know? I was angry. I was beat for being born. I was never good enough, never smart enough. And catch this, never perfect enough. I was told to be perfect, but I was never perfect enough. I couldn't play with the toys. Here's an example. I couldn't play with the toys. So young, I don't know, it's my whole life, so I can't remember when, to be honest with you. But I would, they would, my mother would sit me in the middle of the room and let me look at my toys. Because if I played with them, I'd actually mess them up, and then I wasn't perfect. The room wasn't perfect. I wasn't perfect. I might spill something, do something, mess something. Nobody should live like that. When I went for a drive with my parents in a car, I sat in the back seat. You're like, well, that's not a big deal, but I sat on the ground in the car, the back seat on the ground. Why? Because I was only to be seen when I was called upon. Not, not part of the family. You know, these people who have the little dogs and the handbags, right? right? Like the ultimate dog accessory. Like, that's kind of me. That was me. I was that accessory in my life. I was called upon. I was told. I was told to be, to be as perfect. I was perfect. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. There was pain and there was heartache and there was all these ugly, right? And, I'm, and I kept it to a couple, few short ones for obviously time's sake. But I conformed to trying to be the best that I can be. And at age 10, my mother um, tried to kill my father. And I saw this all happen, all unfold in front of me, that ugly night. And she was almost successful. Um, and I remember this, is that through all of that, I was told that the beatings would continue if I told anybody. Here's the irony, though. They all knew, right? My family and my friends all knew that the beatings were going to happen. And yet, right? And yet, if I told anybody, they would, they would continue. They, of course, they were going to continue. When I was 13, my mother died at the age of 35, and I celebrated. That took me a little while to, to recognize, but I celebrated the fact that she was dead. And she was dead because the pain was finally gone, and I could not understand a God that I had heard of, but I didn't understand how a God that I thought I knew could possibly allow this to happen in my life. I was confused, but, comma, the pain had ended. My father and I built a new relationship over the next couple years, and it was good. She was out of the picture. It was good. And then two years to the day that she died, my father and I were out cutting the lawn, and he died instantly of a coronary. So not only was I now, you know, all of that, like, add that to the story, right? That's a whole lot of ugly. Right? But I was an orphan, and I was all alone. And people felt sorry for me. People, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So sorry. But they did nothing. So if there's a point of this message, maybe just one, that when you see pain and you see suffering, don't make any assumptions. Help people through it. Do something, because they can't help themselves. But remember what I told you, is that I was that person. I was told that I'll be fine. Well, when you're told you're going to be fine in the midst of pain and drama and struggles, there's no comfort in that. What I was told, what I was, I, I was going to be fine because why? Because I was the strong one. Remember, I survived all the pain and all the beatings and all the ugly, right? I was able to do that. So why did people think I needed something else? I was the strong one. I was the survivor. I was the independent person. I could figure it out. And that's where the story gets interesting. I could figure it out. That's what's wrong with it. I could figure it out. I took charge of my life. There was no grieving, not permitted. And at 15 years old, I was on my own and needed to take care of myself. So guess what I did? I went to work. 
I went to work, and at 15, I got out at noon from high school, and I went straight to JCPenney. That's when JCPenney was cool, by the way. <laughs> Just got to level set that with you. It's not all gone, right? But JCPenney. And I found comfort with, with the Bettys of the world, right? The people who, who grafted me into that environment. And they loved me, and they took care of me, and I found it was enjoying, right? It was enjoyment there. Um, it was the beginning, though, however, of something really important and significant in my life, and that was the beginning of hiding pain. I knew how to squelch it, right? I could squelch it. Could, I, could, I could work hard enough and just squelch it down, and, I, and it was the beginning of finding my significance in my accomplishments. If you have nobody in your life and you're looking for something in your life to hold on to and give you significance, in my case, it was my accomplishments. And this worked all my way through school, by the way. College included, too. Put myself through college, worked full time, went to school full time. <sighs> yeah. And um, I continued to strive to break records. I broke records. If there was a record to break, I purposely went out after it. If there was a reward to get, I got it. If there was a reward, I won it. I wanted it. I found my significance and my achievements and my accomplishments because here's what I knew about myself. I was a survivor. I could do it. Right? I could work harder than anybody else to accomplish something that they didn't have the tenaciousness to do, but I did because I needed to make something out of my life. I could do that job that was better. And don't forget that I was that guy who was programmed. Right? I was programmed. I conformed, so now I was programmed to be perfect in every way. Here's where I got it right. I married the right woman. <laughs> I can't even look at her. God knew what I needed, and I did that right. I listened. Praise God for Gabby. <clears throat> I was with two great children. Did that right, too. Woo! <laughs> that feels good. So we got, now we're a family unit, right? We're a family unit and, and life's continuing. And through this whole time, Kathy and the boys are nothing but supportive of me. Kathy's speaking truth into me. She knew the pain I was going through. She tried her best to help me through it. But I was playing the tapes in my head, my head, that would not go away. The pain was too severe and the, and the heartache just too deep to, to deal with it. So there were more moves and more houses Jobs continued, salaries went up. You know, I never really looked for a job in my life. I got the phone call. Hey, Steve, we need you. Company's a mess. Could you? We love you. <laughs> and that's what I did. I took the call. I took the job. I took the next level. Why? Not because I really wanted that job or that move one more time. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be significant. I wanted to have something that I could do something in my life that somebody else couldn't do. So plagued with fear and anxiety, I covered it well, right? But staying one step ahead of yourself is exhausting. Staying one step ahead of the competition in life is, is terrible. You've got to give that up. My life was physically and mentally exhausting. There was no rest. I just kept going. Kept moving, moving forward, doing it, pushing myself. Honey, I'll be home on the weekend. I know I missed that game, but I had to find my significance. Then it all came crashing down. By the world standards, we, I, had everything. Everything you can imagine. The houses and the cars and the money and the beautiful family, right? It was all great. It was all perfect. It was perfect all from the outside. And you know what? It was exactly what my mother was doing to me that I was mimicking. I did exactly the same thing. I needed to be perfect, my life needed to be perfect. And guess what? I was miserable. I was so tired of striving and doing it on my own, but I was too embarrassed to tell anybody because I didn't know anything else. So monumental moment. I took my boys, we were living in Florida, I was working for Sunglass Hut at the time, running stores for them worldwide. And I said, let's go, let's go, let's get away, right, I need to escape. So we went, to where does everybody go? Woo, Disney World, right? <laughs> And then it crashed. Depression hit. Um, I had a nervous breakdown. Because how is it possible that somebody could be in the happiest place on earth and being the most miserable person walking the face of the earth? The contrast was all 
telling the pain was all consuming in my life. I cried out, not to Mickey. <laughs> Actually, I did cry out to Mickey, to be honest with you, but, but it was Mickey, but I also cried out to God. And I said, God, take my life. Because if this is what life is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Take it. Take it. I'm getting no enjoyment in it now. I'm not going to miss anything. I cried out. I was too embarrassed. I took a leave of absence like everybody does who's sick. But let me tell you, I was more than sick. I was depressed. I was miserable, as I've said. I was lonely. And I was also suicidal. It didn't get better. It got worse. Because then when you let somebody know what's going on, if you don't have God, it gets worse. You have nobody. And it's painful. So we were going to church, and my wife and boys all supported. We went to church on Sundays, and we went to the hall on the holidays, and I sang the songs. I did all of that. And I listened to the word of God, but I also doodled my to-do list in the worship guides, by the way. I made my list for what I needed to accomplish later that day or next week. I was half in, half out. That's just factual. And I have to believe sometimes I'm not the only person who lives in that moment, right? I'm here, I'm trying to check a box off. I'm trying to get better, but I didn't know what was going on. But here's the God that we serve. I began to feel better. I felt something, which by the way, no possible way to explain. It was so new to me, but I felt a change. I felt a change in my spirit. There was a contentment for the first time in my life. And even though I was half listening, we serve a God that gives us his best always. So amazing, right? So I'm in this place, I'm listening, and my spirit begins to change inside me. And I remember this so funny. So, um, I mean, I say funny like so good, right? So funny good. Um, having doctors, one doctor after another in Florida, and um, I had a Jewish psychiatrist. And there's not a really punchline to this. It sounds like you should, I went to all Jewish psychiatrists, and. Um, but what he did say to me, it was, you know, oi. Listen, um, I told him, I said, the only place I find any peace in my life is when I'm in church. I didn't say God. I didn't say Jesus. I said in church. He goes, well, then camp out there. Like, that's what he told me to do. This is my Jewish psychiatrist who said camp out there. So that's exactly what I did. I, I did. I would show up to church on occasion, just kind of hang in the sanctuary when nobody else was there. I started in a men's small group. Yes, I sang in the choir, Tim. I know you're hearing me. This is on tape. I still have not yet gotten my invite to sing. And yes, Tim, I can also hit those high notes like you, I'm just saying. But God got a hold of me. He got a hold of me. And we had fun together, and I started to feel better, and I found peace that I didn't. I couldn't explain it still. And then we, I had a neighbor. Kathy and I had dear friends of ours who brought us to the Lord. Hmm. Didn't know what they were doing, but they were very intentional. They could see pain in our household and our family. And, um, and he brought me to Promise Keepers. Yeah, Miami, like 150 degrees, heating, sweating, 50,000 men with their shirts off going praise songs to Jesus. So it's like, like, I didn't know what to do. But I did something, and I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus, and that fellowship and that relationship of that family, our, our family changed. When we would get together with them, things changed because when God is in the, mental of men, in the middle of relationships, things begin to change, and the conversations change. When we had our friends with them and their conversations were different than those of the world, and I knew I wanted to spend more time there. I wanted to spend more time in church, and I wanted to serve the God. My outlook changed. My perspective on life's changed. For the first time, I realized I wasn't a mistake. My life wasn't an accident. I remember that. I remember saying that. I'm not a mistake. My life isn't an accident. I just needed to turn the car keys over to God. And I wish somebody had told me that earlier in my life. When you give your keys to God, God has great plans for you. But if you're in the way, get out of the way. I wish somebody would have told me. Nobody told me, don't let this moment go by for all of us as believers of Jesus because there is only one God who can save us and heal us from ourselves, and that is him. 
that of Jesus Christ. Turn the car keys over sooner than later, and let's just see together where God takes us. It's going to be amazing. I knew that I was saved by my Father, my Heavenly Father, a Father who loved me unconditionally like we talked last week. What was that like? Awesome. It was awesome. I didn't know it. I didn't know what it was like, but I knew that I had a new walk, a new step in my life. A Father who was always going to be there, a Father who would never leave me nor forsake me like my earthly family had done. My wife and my boys were always there, but the pain from my past plagued me. For the first time, I realized that I had a purpose, and that is what in Jesus Christ, and I realized that the enemy was not successful in taking me out. I didn't even know what the enemy was, by the way, back there, but he did not win. He did not take me out. Why? Because God saved me. The, the Father who loved me so much did not allow me to take my own life because he had plans for my life. He wanted to do great things for me, and how could I ever turn my back on that? The jobs came. I accepted him. Jobs continued. I didn't go to, you know, I said this last time, which was, I thought was kind of funny. I didn't go, like, teach yoga, you know? <laughs> like, I found Jesus. I'm now going to teach yoga. No, I didn't do that. I kept working. I kept working working. I kept working hard because I had a new meaning, a new purpose in my, law, in my life. My responsibilities as a husband and a father changed. They got meaningful for the first time. It wasn't a to-do list and a nice to-do and a honey, I love you so much, but I actually fell in love with my family because of the relationship I had with God. All changed. Everything changed. I had a new meaning in my life. I had a new victory. Praise you, Lord. I walk in victory. I learned that. I learned to walk in victory and not in defeat. I saw the glass half full versus half empty, and I heard him say this to me. I heard him say this to me. I have made you to do amazing things in my name, Steve, not in your name. In my name, Steve. So here I am today. I knew all along right, what I needed. He knew all along what I needed, and I listened to his voice, and I praise him for that. I praise him today that I get to hear his voice. And now when I speak to him and when I ask him, he's there. And he's there for you as well. You just simply need to ask. Today I see Jesus in the middle of everything I do. And that's not trite to say that, right? Yes, I'm a, you know, executive pastor, and I better see Jesus, right? No, I see Jesus in the middle of everything I do. And I do it because I serve a God. I serve a God that loved me so much, he took care of me, and how can I not do that for others? He loved me that much to put me and give me purpose in my life so that indeed there can be a difference that we can all make in our lives. And yes, people who know me might even call me an encourager. I've been called that before. Worse, by the way. Um, <laughs> but an encourager, but an encourager. Why? Because we serve a God who loved us so much, so let's go out there and love others the same way that he sees each and every one of us. Who am I to judge? Nobody. Without receiving that unconditional love that we spoke about last week and we spoke about today, that was over 22 years ago, I would never know how to love. So you want your life to be different, you want, to, you want to see a change, you want to have some purpose and some meaning, then realize this message, that you belong to his family, and he has great plans for you, and he wants to use you in a powerful, mighty way. Here's the good news for all of us, that you are members of God's very own family, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. It is not a mistake today that we're here together and we're hearing this. Think about that. Aaron calls me, Pastor Aaron calls me up this week, says, will you do the message? I freak out a little bit, then I realize this is not an accident, right? What week are we on and what, are, what, are, what on earth am I here for? And we're talking about belonging. We're talking about the most broken, belonged, lack of belonged person you could ever found. And we're talking about that. God is a genius. He's a genius. It doesn't matter what our families come from. I got to tell you, my screwed up family Right? 
We all have one. And the most important thing here to capture and to write down is that we are part of God's family, the one that will last forever and ever. Your physical family, catch this, your physical family is just a channel to get you into God's family. God's plan and his purpose in my life was not for me to be hurt or harmed, but he knew that there was a success. There he knew that there was going to be victory by following his voice. Your spiritual family is actually more important than your physical family. And we put so much weight on our physical family, don't we? Let's be in the presence of God. Let's learn his word. Let's be with him, our spiritual family. Let's be with each other that we get to call brothers and sisters. I want your identity to last and put it into something that's never going to change, and that indeed is your spiritual family. In Hebrews, it says this, Jesus and the people he makes holy all belong to the same family. There's that word again. Belong to the same family. Not somebody else's family. The same family, his family. That is why he isn't ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. I just alluded to that. Brothers and sisters, right? Little cray-cray here or there, right? Little sin in our lives. He's not talking about that. He's talking that he is not ashamed of our past. We are called brothers and sisters of Christ. He loves us that much. He knows what we're going through. All we have to do is allow him into our lives. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're in the family. So the second metaphor is this. In God's temple, I'm supported by others. Supported by others. In God's temple. Why is that? Why did God choose this illustration? Well, for a building right? For a building. This is the second benefit that you get from being part of the family of God. Let's look just for a second. Let's just think about this, and we'll go quickly through this, but let's look through this at this worship center right now. We've got a concrete floor. We have steel beams. We have a great roof over our head. We have an opportunity to be safe and secure and to worship God. In our lives, in our lives, we're just like a building. There's some times in it where we're going to need the support and the structure and the confidence that we get by being safe within a building, within a temple. It's not an accident, right, that he's doing this metaphor. The metaphor of strength and stamina. Building means he wants to build us up through the support and the love that he's sharing with us. The Bible says this, in Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So as we're building ourselves up, the body of Christ is building each other up. The power of the Holy Spirit is coming alive in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to claim right now, I want more of the spirit in my life. I want all of that. I want, if I know that all of God is in Christ, then I want all of Christ to be in me. Without that, what am I doing? I'm doing it on my own. I want all of what he has for me. So together, we are formed the family of God. And of course, what we've just talked about is the temple of God. You know, I came with this little example, and that is, um, who likes Legos? As a child, I had Legos. I just couldn't play with them, remember? <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. So Legos are significant, right? Independently, right? This is significant, right? One Lego is, oh, that's kind of nice. It's cool. It's blue. It's cool. Got it, right? I think it's actually more of a Duplo, but that's okay. Um, but it's significant, but independently, it's not very useful. So you know where I'm going, right? You put this together, right, and we're connected in the body of Christ, and you put more than one Lego, or maybe you have a bucket full of Legos, and you're able to do something amazing in your life, because independently, we could do something, but together, we're going to do more than we can ever imagine. The key is to listen to God and do what only God wants us to do, because then that building we're building, right, that project he's called us to, how we're supposed to invest in somebody's life because we answered the call. It's going to be better because we're doing it together. It's me getting out of the way and allowing the Holy Spirit to move in my life so that together we can build great things. In Romans, it says this, I want to help each other with the faith that we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. The more we focus on faith, the more faith increases in us, 
the more faith we have as the body of believers because we were what? We're now supported and we know each other. The more faith we have, the more we can do. The more blessing there is, the more rewards in heaven there are in and over our life, and we can see that which will bring people to Jesus because the more submitted and committed we are to that of the Lord because our faith rises. It's like our small groups and the summer, how powerful they are. You know, it's like we're not doing small groups as individuals. I could hand out the flyer and the little notebook. But we're choosing to do it in groups because we strengthen each other when God is in the center of that. So we have family and we have temple, we just talked about, and now let's talk about Christ's body. In Christ's body, I discover my unique value. Say unique. Unique, Unique, meaning special, individual, important. Right? And I mean the good unique. Everybody even say, well, he's kind of unique. No, I don't mean that unique. I mean, like, he's unique. He's creative. He's special. He's important. He has value. That kind of unique. In Romans, it says this, just as there are many parts of the body, so is there in Christ's body. We are all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have different work to do. So we belong to each other, and each of us need each other. Don't miss that. It's not, it's not, it'd be nice if you hung out together. It's not some what we're talking about. We need each other. We're all connected together. We're all important. We all complete the body together. So if you want to go it on your own, give that a try. I did that. It didn't get me very far. I wish I had known. But now we do know, right? We know the word of God in our lives, and he's calling us to be connected to each other. All of a sudden, when we're connected together like these Legos, we find ourselves, we find a place, right? We find a spot that we can call home. We find a niche, let's just say, in our lives that can only be fulfilled by being with God's people, by being part of the body of Christ. We actually, this word belong to the church, we belong to the body. We belong. And the Bible says this, if if I'm a foot, If your foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less part of the body. I think we would know that. And if your ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm only an ear and not an eye, would that make me any less part of the body? And the good body said, of course not. No, no. But how many times do we think we should operate alone when we have the opportunity to find friendship together better? It's not just a slogan. It's the truth. Nobody is like you. Just look around. Look to your left. Look to your right. Nobody's like you. Nobody smells like you. Nobody, that's good news, right? Nobody, everybody's variety. There's not a room full of Steves in here. Praise God for that, right? We're all unique. We're all special, and we all complete the body. Nobody can say I'm not important. Every single one is important. Because why? Because God put us here. Every single one of us is important. We find our significance when we work together and we do important work. That's when we become important. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. He's driving a point home. In each, in Christ's body, in God, we are connected with each other. So let's review really quickly. In God's family, we find our identity. In the temple, we're supported by each other. In Christ's body, we discover our unique abilities and value. And now in God's flock, we're banded together. God's flock. Psalm 100 says this, and this is not in your notes. It says, God made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. His. God made us and we are his. Am I a sheep? I guess I don't really ever think about myself as that. But here's the answer to the question, we are. We are all sheep. Yes, we are sheep, and yes, we are in a flock. So preparing, I did my sheep research. And here's what, here's what I found. I found that sheep are pretty innocent animals. Now, I think I might have known that if somebody pushed me in a corner and said, tell me about sheep. I'd probably say, oh, I guess they're pretty innocent. Um, But what I did not really know is that they have no natural defense mechanisms at all. 
they, they, they have no natural defense against any level of predator. Any level of predator. They're like, they run the other way. They don't even know what to do. They just kind of like stand there, right, and get attacked. So they have to be protected by shepherds. They have to. Not maybe could. They have to be protected by shepherds if they're going to survive and live. They require more care than a cow or a horse. Hmm. I guess I'm a sheep. So I want you to do this for me. Close your eyes. Give yourself just a moment to breathe. And I want to read over you what Psalm 23 says about being sheep. Because I could keep talking and tell you more about sheep, but I think I would rather hear the word of God and what he calls us to. And it says this, Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. He lets me... He lets me rest in meadow grass, and he leads me beside quiet streams. He gives me new strength. He helps me do what honors him the most. And when I'm walking through the darkest valleys of death, I won't be afraid, for you are close behind me, guarding me, guiding me all the way. You provide delicious food for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as your guests. Blessings overflow. Your goodness and unfailing kindness shall be with me all of my life. And afterwards, I will live with you forever in your home. You can open your eyes. You want to be sheep? I want that spoken over my life. That's the kind of protection I want. That's the God that I serve, that I can hold firm and stand firm on that truth. So let's go right to Jesus and let's find out what he said about being sheep and being a shepherd. Why don't you do the same things with me? Close your eyes. And he says this, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A hired hand runs away because he cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. I lay down my life for my sheep, and they listen to my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish no one will ever be able to snatch my sheep out of my hands. You can open your eyes. Nobody, no one, nobody will ever be able to snatch my sheep out of my hands. When we're family, we're family forever. That's good news. Now you want to be sheep? Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Yes, we do, because we know we're loved, we know we're protected, we know we're cared for, right? Do you know what the Greek word is for, for shepherd? It's actually pastor. Yeah. Pastors are to be shepherds of the flock. We all need someone who's going to step up for us to guide us and give us good, strong, biblical truths. And let me just say thank you to Pastor Aaron to our leaders here, to our dream teams, to our host homes for small groups, for everybody who takes a call to answer somebody who's hurting, who needs help, who needs something that somebody is reaching out to, and they say yes to that. So it's more than just being the pastor or having a title. It has everything to do with the heart. That's what it means to be the good shepherd to have the right heart. And each of us have that calling on our lives. If we claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he wants to use you. We are all ministers of the word of God. So in God's flock, here's good news, fill in the blank, I'm protected and I'm cared for. First Peter says it this way, take care of God's flock. You take care of God's flock. that his people, that you are responsible for, watch over them because you want to, not because you are forced to, because your heart is in a place where you want to. The Bible says this about one another. It says, encourage one another, greet one another, help one another, period. Period. Two important verses, share with each other the troubles and problems, and in this way, obey the law. Encourage each other and give each other strength. That is a not to do, good to do, maybe so to do. It is a command. So when we open ourselves up and we walk down these stairs and we come in from the family center and we're coming into a place, God's place, 
let's open ourselves up to a place where we can be vulnerable, where we can share each other's troubles and problems. It's an obey. We have to obey the law of Christ. It says it's a command. Friendship relationships are built when we are the most vulnerable. Stop pretending. Stop trying to be perfect. Stop conforming. It doesn't work. So the final description is this, of that of a garden, and it's of a vineyard, which I think is even more appropriate for all of us. What's that say? We probably need God a little bit more here on the West Coast. But we, it's a, that of a vineyard. And I would say it's a fair assumption that if you think about a vineyard, right, and you think about a garden, that we want to be productive. And I want to, I want to hit this point here is that in our lives, I think we all want to do meaningful work. We want to do good things. We want to be productive in our lives, right? We want to end. We want to say our life mattered. We want to do good things. When people say, oh, that Steve guy, well, he, you know what? Wow, he got, he got a lot done for the kingdom. For the kingdom. How does it all align, right? How does it align to the word of God? That's what we need to be thinking about. That's what I want to be productive for, and maybe so you too. Right? I didn't say, when I gave you that example about, I didn't change being a husband or change being a father. I just was a more effective one. Why? For him. Because in that, in that, there's God. There's God. He loves me so much, he's called me to responsibility. I want to be productive for him. And Jesus says it this way, I am the vine and you are the branch. We are connected. There is life flowing through and we're able to bear good fruit. Man, vine, branch, flowing. It all has to work together. And I'm talking about not just, if your vision, if your mind goes to somebody picking a little apple off of a tree or a pear, I'm talking about bushels of fruit here, people. I'm talking about God's plan for our life is to put bushels and bushels of fruit in our lives because we're connected. Independently, we're not gonna pick a lot of fruit, but with him, we can pick bushels of fruit. That's what I call being productive. In God's garden, my life becomes productive, fill in the blank. As a person who tried to do it on his own for so long, and I saw successes, don't get me wrong, but there was no fulfillment. Zero fulfillment. You want to, want to have fruit that has meaning? Stay connected to the vine. And I'm not talking about being busy, because we use that word very often here, especially in our part of the world, right? We're busy. We're all busy. So busy, right? I am talking about a different kind of busy. I'm talking about doing the work of God. John says it this way, a branch cannot produce fruit from its severed, or if it's severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful apart from me. Stay connected. I am the vine and you are the branch and those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. There you go. You want more in your life? You want more? You want to show up? You want your life to have more meaning? Then stay more, con more connected to the vine. It's not about what your to-do list is or what you think you now need to go and do. It's about staying more connected, spending more time with him, spending more time in his word. Allow him to love you more. And guess what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. Bushels of fruit. I remember Kathy and I, just a little under four years ago, coming and walking down those stairs that I've mentioned a couple times here, and I remember hearing, we both heard Pastor Aaron, and it was awesome, and we, 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 we walked out that day, and um, people were friendly, and they were nice, and it was great, and we just said, well, that was easy. We found a new home. And I think about our church today, and I think about Coastline here, and I think about the fact that this is a church that's centered on the Word of God, the Word of God reigns supreme here, supreme. It is powerful and it is mighty. Our pastors encourage us and challenge us. Our friends support us, by the way, in good times and bad. And when we get to serve and when we do serve, we get out of ourselves. We leave ourselves behind. We just simply do. We leave ourselves behind. I don't know about you, but I can get in my head really easy. right? And I can think all this stuff. But the minute that I get out of myself and onto God and doing His work, Everything changes in my life. And maybe that's for all of us today in some small way that the calling in our life is to belong, 
to belong. You love that. You work with those people where you know you're called to. So let's not just do life independently. Let's do life together. It's more than a little tagline on our front of our bulletin, right? Our worship guide. Do life together. Do life together. It's a command. And watch how God is going to change your life for the better. You know, people say to me all the time, Jesus, right? I love the Jesus thing and I love the God thing, but the church thing doesn't really quite work for me. I'm like, you're a crazy person. <laughs> I don't say that. I think it. I'm like, how is it possible that you want all of what God wants for you, but yet you don't want to stay connected to the vine? You don't want to be in the body of Christ and his temple and do all the things that God has called us to do. It ain't going to work. It's not going to work. You have to be connected to the body because we support and we love each other and we take care of each other. So let's, let's leave today, let's leave today knowing that that word belong is powerful and mighty and it is a calling on our lives. You know, there's no accident today that um, the verse is this, our final verse that we're going into, what on earth am I here for? And it says this, Paul reminds us of this. You are members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every Christian. Know it. Memorize it. It's very clear. You belong here in God, in his household with every Christian. We are to strengthen each other. And I have to tell you, I don't think there's a better place to be strengthened, to be loved, to be supported than the place that we get to call home, which is Coastline. So that's it, guys. Done and done. Um, But before we have the team lead us and, and, and send us out, can I just pray for all of us for just a quick second and give God some glory? So God, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word that reigns supreme in our lives. Lord, that Holy Spirit, have your way with us. Lord, thank you today for highlighting one thing, two things, three things in my life that I want to do to follow you closer. Lord, allow me to just sit at your feet and receive all that you have. And I thank you for grafting me into your family. Lord, thank you for bringing me here. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for being part of the family. Lord, thank you for your temple. Lord, I know I am protected and I'm loved by you. And I'm loved by each and every one of us that are here today hearing your word. So God, thank you. Lord, protect us, guide us as you, we know we can trust on that. And Lord, give us just an amazing weekend where we get to celebrate the freedom we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.